Hey folks, good to see you again, or glad you could see me and join me this evening. I wish I could see you, uh, but glad you could join us for our midweek connection uh, once again. And we're looking at the, a few of the letters and messages to the churches in Revelation. And we're going to kind of close that out uh, today by looking at the, the last church, the last message, which the, was to the church at Laodicea. This wasn't such a good feel-good message. This wasn't a uh, this wasn't one of those milk toast messages. This, this was one that was straight and to the point. This was a little stepping on the toes message that Jesus gave uh, Laodicea. As I mentioned last week when we were talking about the church at Philadelphia, some of uh, the churches and some of the interpretations for these messages are described in terms of periods of time in history. And so this Laodicean church, since it is the last one that Jesus addressed, uh, is believed to refer to most likely the, the, the end toward the end times uh, and what some would say the latter days and perhaps the days that we are now in, uh, the latter days. We don't know what that means. I'm not putting a time frame on what latter days means uh, except that we know that we live in a world that is very troubled. and We've seen many things and we know many examples of that. And the Laodicean church was somewhat of an example of that. And as we're going to see, it's just the opposite from the church at Philadelphia that we looked at uh, last week. So in Revelation chapter 3, uh, the, uh, Jesus through John uh, writes this letter uh, to Laodicea. And once again, Jesus describes himself as he always does. He said, the words of the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And that's just a, a few beautiful but real descriptions of Jesus Christ. And so he begins in verse 15 and he says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now that's not a very encouraging word, is it? That's coming from Jesus. I thought Jesus was loving and just was always going to pat us on the back and say, it's okay, you know, we just... No, Jesus had some strong words, some very convictional words for the church at Laodicea. Now, last week we mentioned that the church at Philadelphia had no condemnation. He commended them for what they'd done and for their faithfulness and for their enduring and for their uh, just, just being faithful to God's word and his name. Uh, but the Laodicean church was just the opposite. He had... No commendation, nothing really good to say. And so what it boils down to is Laodicea is known as the lukewarm church, as he says in verse 16. You are lukewarm. I'd rather you be cold or hot, but you're lukewarm. I, 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 I wish I could just spit you out of my mouth. Well, Jesus was, was pretty direct, wasn't he? He made it very, very clear what he thought about the Laodicean church. Talks about lukewarmness and how he dislikes lukewarmness. I can relate to that a little bit. I like my coffee hot. I had a discussion uh, with Corey uh, just, just today. We were talking about hot coffee and cold coffee and uh, you know I have to have, a hot, have it hot or I just can't have it at all. And I like it hot. And if, I, if I eat soup in the winter time, I want that soup hot. And, uh, the rest of the staff tease me sometimes because on more than one occasion I have sent my coffee back, I've sent my soup back because it wasn't hot enough. I wanted, I, if it's supposed to be hot, I want it hot. And because I'm from the South, I like my tea ice cold. Iced tea and hot coffee. And that's what works best. And I don't like anything in between. Well, spiritually speaking, the Lord doesn't either. He does not like lukewarmness. He detests lukewarmness. And so what exactly is he uh, referring to uh, here when he talks about it? Well, lukewarmness is just... Uh, that way, that time when we, the, the church or we have lost our fire, our fervor, our passion for the Lord, and apparently or obviously that had happened to the Laodicean church. They had lost that fire for the Lord. They were just on the getting by phase. They were on the, well, I'm going to go to church and I'm just going to do this and I'm going to do that, but there was no passion, no zeal, no spiritual fire. And so he goes on to describe where they were. And what we do, what we find out is some characteristics of the lukewarm church and the lukewarm believer, the lukewarm Christian. 
And so Jesus describes that to them in verse 17. He says, For you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So he let them have it pretty good. And he described several things that, that, that demonstrate the lukewarm church and the lukewarm Christian that we can find ourselves in if we're not careful, if we don't keep our focus and our heart and our zeal for the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, uh, they could be described as being comfortable. He said, for you say, I am rich. I have prospered. They had things. They had everything they needed, they thought. Self-sufficient. Prosperity. They had it all. They were rich. Problem is they were depending on their wealth and, and their position. See, Laodicea was a large city, a very commercial city at that time. Apparently the church was very large and, and very strong, but the problem was their perceived strength. What they were depending upon was actually their weakness. And that happens a lot in our lives. That which we perceive as strong can become our weakness, can become a substitute for dependence upon God. So they were depending on those things. So they were comfortable. They were also content. They said, I need nothing. I don't need it. We don't need anything. We, we, we've got it all together. We have arrived. We are Laodicea. We're the, we are the big church on the hill. And we don't need anything uh, physically, materially, but also spiritually. See, the relationship uh, between the two is, is very important. When, when spiritual satisfaction comes, in other words, I have all I need of God. I'm good, we're good, we don't need anything, we're covered. That's when problems arise. We don't recognize our need for God. We lose our dependence upon God, upon the Lord. And that's, that's when we start getting into trouble. And so lukewarmness results from that, results from that lack of spiritual fervor that God wants us to have. And it comes from that lack of desire and that need, and that longing for God's presence, uh, for God's power and all the things that God wants to offer us. So they were comfortable, they were content, and then they compromised. They were compromised. As verse uh, 17 continues on, it says, you are wretched. You're not realizing you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. All of these things, they uh, had, had lost their, their values. They had compromised their values. They had become proud of their ministry. And they begin to measure things by the world's standards, uh, worldly standards instead of spiritual standards. Uh, and all of that lost to that, uh, those descriptions that God gave them. They thought they were rich. They were really poor. They, they, they thought they you know, were, were in their splendor of their fine clothes and their fine things. And he says, well, you're really naked. And they thought they had all they needed. Laodicea is believed to be a no, have been known for some type of eye salve back in that day that helped the eyes. And so that which they thought they were known for and famous for uh, actually resulted in spiritual blindness. When you lose your passion, your desire for God, you lose your vision. And that's what had happened to the Laodicean uh, church. But Jesus, as He always does, He... He had a way back for them. He had a remedy for them. He had a, a path of returning to them, and it's always through Him. The path to return is always through Jesus Christ. So with all that that He said for them, that you're pitiful, uh, poor, blind, naked, all of those things, verse 18, He says to them, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. You understand what Jesus is doing? He, 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 he spiritualized, which he can do, especially because he's God. And he said, the very things that you, you thought you were depending on, I, I want to offer you the real thing. He wasn't talking about physical gold. He says, I want to offer you the gold that I offer that is refined by fire. I want to refine you. I want to purify you. I want to clothe you. The Bible says put on the, uh, the, the armor of God and also to clothe yourself in the righteousness of God. 
He says, I want to do that. I, I want you to, uh, I'm going to give you white robes. And white just was a picture of purity, a picture of the righteousness of God. And he said, I want to do all that for you. I want to restore you to your beauty, to your spiritual beauty, to your spiritual value. I want to return that fire uh, to you. See, they had lost their fire. He says, I want you to restore the fire. I want you to get rid of the lukewarmness. I want you to rekindle the fire that is within you. Paul said the same thing to Timothy. Timothy was struggling. He was timid. He was afraid. And in 2 Timothy 1.6, he says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. In other words, he said, get fired up, Timothy. And I believe that's what God's saying to us today and to the church today. The church needs to get fired up. We need to get fired up about God, get fired up about Jesus, fired up about the mission and the ministry of the church and return to that zeal and that fervor and that passion that God so desperately wants us to have. And he tells them how, how they can do it. You can repent. Sin must be confessed and repented. Turn away from sin and self and turn to God. And then we can, turn, we can return to him. Now look at uh, verse, verse 20. And this is a very important verse, a very famous verse that many preachers use when they preach. Jesus says to the church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Jesus offers this wonderful invitation. He says, I'm standing at the door of your heart, knocking at the door, wanting for you to let me in. Now that's a picture of salvation. But because Jesus is talking to the church here, and some of these folks may not have been saved, but there is also a message for believers and for the church here. There's a message for those of you, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, that Jesus is knocking at your door and He wants to come in and be your Savior. But even though we can't lose our salvation, as we've seen from this Laodicean church, you can lose the joy and the passion, the joy of your salvation and your passion for the Lord. And that's what had happened. And Jesus says, I want to come back in and be not just there. I want to be the center of your life. And so I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. Won't you let me in? And he offers that same invitation to you. You'll have my presence. I want to be the center of your life. I want to have fellowship with you. I want to have an intimate relationship with you. Not just for salvation, but for that abundant life we've talked about. And these were the words that God wrote, Jesus said to the Laodicean church. And then in verse 21, he gives, a, he gives a promise, wonderful promise to this church. Once they return and once they open the door and let him back into their lives and let them back into their church and, and become the center, he says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered, he conquered sin and death, remember that, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. I find a beautiful little, maybe it's a little play on words, but I find it a beautiful wording here that basically Jesus says, I'm knocking at the door and I ask you uh, to let me come into your heart. Let me come into your house. In other words, Jesus is saying, you invite me into your house, who you are, to be your Savior, be your Lord, return that spiritual fervor, re return to that fire, get rid of that lukewarmness. You let me into your house now and I'm going to let you spend eternity in mine. I'm going to let you spend eternity in heaven. Oh, my friend, that's a pretty good offer. That's a pretty good deal. That God wants to have that intimacy and that fellowship with you right now, but also into eternity. And remember, everything we look at in the Christian life ought to be in view of eternity because that's, God is in the eternity business. And he wanted the church at Laodicea to return to him, return to that zeal, return with that fire. He wants that for them, and He wants that for you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and continue to remember those with special needs, those who are hurting, those who are sick, grieving, uh, struggling through the coronavirus pandemic, that even though it's getting better and things are starting to look better and things are starting to open up and we'll be back in worship 
uh, in just a little over a week, and we'll be rejoicing about that. But that we're still people hurting, still people who need our prayers. And we need to pray for one another. We need to pray for ourselves that we won't be the lukewarm church, that you won't be the lukewarm Christian, but you'll let God restore and return the fire to your heart and your life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for all your goodness and grace. Lord, we thank you that, that you are the beginning and the end and the faithful and true witness. And Lord, I pray for any here, for any of us that at times may have lost our spiritual fervor, maybe have gone through or maybe right now going through a period of lukewarmness. We've lost our passion. We've lost our zeal. We've lost our fire for you and, and your word and the church and the body of Christ and the mission and the ministry of the church. And Father, I pray that you would lead us, Lord, and return us, return that zeal and that passion that you so desperately want for us that we need in this day. And the world needs to see a church that means business, a church that is on fire for the Lord because there are people that are hurting us. Lord, I pray we would be that church. We would be those people. And Lord, we pray for those who are continuing to struggle, whatever the cause may be, for those who are still dealing with the a coronavirus. Lord, for those who have lost loved ones uh, through this or by other means, whatever, whatever reason, Lord, you just minister your love and grace and comfort and peace in their lives. And people who are struggling financially, uh, Lord, relationships, marriages that may be struggling, Lord, I pray that people would place their faith and their trust in you. And let you restore the joy of their salvation. Restore the fire. Bring back the passion, the fervor, the zeal. And Lord, as the old song says, you would set our souls afire for you. We thank you and we love you and thank you for the place that you've prepared for eternity for us. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, thank you for once again for joining us and we do want to remind you June 7th is the day, and we'll be back together worshiping. And uh, You should have received uh, information regarding uh, how that's going to work and how that's going to look. And if you're not a First Baptist Church member and you live somewhere else or attend church somewhere else, I trust your church is maybe getting ready to resume or already has. We encourage you to be faithful wherever your church is or whatever that is, and you just serve the Lord with gladness, with joy, and with fire. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a blessed week.